include sample multiple choice questions on the topic. These types of sample multiple choice questions are going to be the same kind of questions that you would see on uh, the test. For example, the, the, the way it works is that the, the, the origin of life guided lecture questions includes questions to guide this lecture and multiple choice questions on the last topic. So for example, the last topic we did before origin of life was back revolution, wasn't it? So look at question number one. One way to increase the number of organisms in an endangered species is to let the few remaining individuals of the species breed with each other. However, this breeding may also lead to species extinction because inbreeding over a short period of time may increase beneficial mutations, produce a different species, reduce genetic diversity, or increase fertility. What do you guys think? You want to pay attention, right? One way to increase the number of organisms on an endangered species is to let a few of the remaining individuals of that species breed. However, this breeding may also lead to species extinction because of inbreeding over a short period of time. Why? Because this may increase the beneficial mutations, produce different species, reduce genetic diversity, or increase fertility. All right, does increased fertility seem like something that's going to make the species more endangered? No. That's stupid. Uh, increased beneficial mutations will make the species more dangerous. No. So those are just contra they don't match the prompt. So the prompt is a negative prompt, and those are positive options. You already had a 55% shot, and the EOC, 50% is passing. You're literally passing on reading skill at that point. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So that's a strategy for these tests, okay? You, you have to pay attention to the prompt. If the, if the questions don't match the prompt, sometimes it's real biology facts even, but they have nothing to do with the prompt, and that's how you rule them out. Now, to produce a different species, you need them to separate into two separate communities, so that's contrary to the whole produce different species, right? So it has to be reduced genetic diversity, which makes sense in breeding, reduce genetic diversity, right? So all right, another one. Uh, the differences in the, uh, in, in the characteristics of a flower, uh, okay, never mind, because you don't have the picture for that one. Here's, here's one that's interesting. I'll try to show you this a little closer. The eastern mad madlark and the western madlark are two closely related bird species. The two species avoid interbreeding because they have different mating songs. This is most likely an example of Adaptive radiation, behavioral isolation, geographic isolation, or artificial selection. Yes, Kat? Behavioral isolation. Behavior isolation. They sing differently. Very I'm good. Caitlin. Caitlin, that's what I meant. Yeah. I meant Caitlin. All right, sorry about that. The island of Algebra lies 400 kilometers off the coast of Africa. It is home to the Algebra rail, a long legged wetland bird. The Algebra rail is flightless and much different from the rails that live on the mainland. This bird has become distinctively a different species through geographical isolation, behavior isolation, adaptive radiation, or convergence. What do you got? Geographical isolation. So see, these questions are practice questions on the macroevolution topic, which is the topic that precedes this topic. Every GLQ has practice questions. Why not do them? Because those are the same kinds of questions you'll see in your test. Some of them might even show up on your test. Are you with me? All right. Okay, so let's talk about these things. Last class, we started talking about origin and history of life, and I introduced the game of life with about uh, by uh, John Conway, and I talked about the point of that game of life was to get you thinking about something very crucial. A lot of people say that you need a design to get order from chaos, that in order to have this box, Someone had to design and build it. Now that seems true, but because it's a box, it's a product of our intelligence. But to apply the same concept to the universe is a stretch. And here's why. The universe is not randomly made the way it is. It's not, life is not randomly made the way it is because there are rules, rules of physics that allow things to progress the way they progress. And if you have a random beginning and a set of rules, order can arise from those rules 
alone, without the need of a design. Now, what the product of that is, is no specific purpose, no specific design. It could have been done another way, right? And that's true. At one point, this world was headed towards a dinosaur look, but then things went bad for them. And then now we have a mammal dominance in the world. But things could go bad for us. You know, meteors are rock walking around us all the time. Gamma ray bursts, a solar flare, a massive epidemic, human-caused habitat destruction. Could be a million different things. Could bring back the downfall of a lot of species, and then the world could change. Right? And that's something that we're going to talk about. It has happened before. Uh, the, the Hindus have a, a philosophy that's very interesting, the ancient Hindu philosophy, actually. Not so much the current in the philosophy, but in general. And there's actually a lot of world philosophers that share this mentality. That this has happened, and it will happen again. You know? It's the, the idea that things are cyclical in some, sometimes. And, it, and life certainly has shown that the whole mass extinction thing is a cycle. It keeps happening. So it is an inevitability that it will happen again. The question is, will we make it? Now... Why is evolution, you did us a question already, so I'm just doing reviewing because I want to make sure I cover this today. Today we're going to talk about the origin of life uh, and maybe a little bit of the natural history topic stuff. Next class we're going to get into the history of life and then hopefully uh, have some time left today and next class to talk to activities, but first we're going to make sure we finish covering this. So Felix, yes. what is a, a theory in science? Oh. Okay. What does that mean when I say it's a scientific theory? The scientific theory is like, okay. Uh, a scientific theory is not only really a hypothesis, but it has evidence. As evidence. Very good. That's what I was looking for. A lot of evidence. A hypothesis is before or after an experiment? Before. Is it, is it proven? In fact, a hypothesis is designed to be disproven. Meanwhile, a theory is supported, but you can never really support a hypothesis. You can only reject it or fail to reject it. They're very different things. Now, is evolution a theory or a hypothesis? So what does that mean about evolution? It's a working explanation too. That means we can use it, it explains a lot of things, it makes sense. Does it mean it is the truth? No. no, but it means that it's the best truth we have. Right? Okay, so what about abiogenesis? Is that a hypothesis or a theory? So what does that mean? It's someone's idea about what happens. Now, last class, I think I taught you this. If I didn't, I'm going to do it now, but in order for something to be a hypothesis, what does it need to have? Does anybody know about that? What? what is a hypothesis about, really, usually? Yes? It's try. like your thought on, on what you think. Yeah, but how does a hypothesis usually structure? With observations. It's, oh, what did you say? With observations. Because you just said that? Mm -hmm. It has to be testable. Oh. That's the key. Give them three labels. Right? And it usually sets up a relationship between two variables. Just it. That's it. If this is true, then this is true. Are you with me? Now, in general, it's a testable statement about the relationship between two things. All right? Now, how is, how is the, 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 the statement, the world was created, right? A hypothesis. The thing about that is that it's not testable. Because in order to test that, you would have to create the world. Are you with me, I'm sorry to say? Not only that, even if you were to create a world, do you prove that the world that you are in was created? No, you're only proven that you can create a world. Are you with me? How do you prove creation? You can't. Creation is faith. At some point, you just got to close your eyes and say, I believe in this, and that's it. But that's not science, you see, because that's not even a hypothesis, because you can't test it. Can I test it, whether or not? Now, this, is a, this, is a, this is the statement that abiogenesis make. Based on physical rules, life can, be, can come out of a, we're going to talk about it today. These hypotheses that we're going to introduce right now, which is the objective, no hypothesis associated with the origin of life. Can they be tested? If the answer is, yes, I can at least collect evidence to try to test it, then there are valid hypotheses. That doesn't mean, though, that it's a true statement and it still needs to be further tested for you to get to that point that you call it a, hypo uh, a theory. Are you with me? Maybe someday we'll have a theory of the origin of life. But right now, we have several hypotheses that need to be tested.
Test it first. Is your destiny. It is your destiny. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's oh, keep playing with this. Sir, All right. Yes. Go ahead. If if let's say like right now there's theory, but then on the future they found more evidence um for it. Do they change the theory um to make another? I have theory, no or? idea if the camera is working. <laughs> Hopefully, sorry. Hopefully the audio will work at least but it seems to be frozen oh well okay repeat your question please like, I, I don't know how to say oh, it but like please. like let's say there's a we have a theory right now uh -huh. but then the future we find find more evidence to it we just add it onto the theory or like we change or we even change it completely so the the prevailing theory of gravity in the time of isaac newton after the time of isaac newton is that when you let things go, it falls straight towards the ground because of a force that acts as a field that pushes it towards the ground, towards the center of the earth. That's completely, complete bull. The ground is in the force. That's actually, that's actually not what happens at all. And that's actually what still people think, right? 99% of the human population think that, think that things fall, and that's actually not true. Nothing falls. What? All right? If the, see? So, you see what this is about education is? What, uh, this is, I'm going out, outside there. Anybody has a sweater anymore? Uh, okay. So, <laughs> can, you, can you stand up and help me here? Can you hold this end of the sweater? And if you help me as well, hold this end of the sweater. Okay. So then, space. Can you guys turn around so this class can see you because you're blocked? All right. Space is like this sweater. Right? This is the universe, the space of the universe. When the Earth goes in space, it does this to it. So what is it doing to the, to the space? Bending. It's bending the space. But this is not just space. It's something called space-time. Okay? So that's like the, when you add to space the dimension of time, it becomes a fourth dimensional thing called space-time. Earth bends both by its presence in space-time. Which means, when you're close to the Earth, time goes by faster. Like literally. So if you're an astronaut living in out of space, because you're far from Earth's gravitational pull, you'll, your, your clock ticks a little slower. Now that sounds like bullshit, but it's actually true, because the satellite's clocks that we use for GPS have to be adjusted compared to clocks on the ground for this ge general relativity effect. This is Einstein's work, by the way. If you don't adjust the clock of the satellites, GPS doesn't work. So it's two. Bends time. It also bends space. So now, have you ever gone to the mall and seen a little coin that rolls around, right? That's actually simulating a, what's called a gravitational well, all right? Where, so what are you really doing when you jump up is that you're trying to climb up that hill. But since the hill was like that, you just roll back into it. So technically, no, nothing is falling straight towards the ground. Everything is rolling down a gravity well. Now, it makes a big difference because think about geometry. If you're talking about moving from here to here, that's a straight line, right? But really, that's not a straight line because Earth is bending it. So it's really a, 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 some sort of parabolic shape. And so, no, so... Go. Okay, so thank you. So then, did you guys ever hear of Euclidean geometry? No? Okay, so and then there's other types of geometry too. But a lot of the things you learn in school are, are, are one type of geometry. But then, in Euclidean, I'll give you an example. In Euclidean geometry, things, when you draw a straight line, in Euclidean geometry, that's a circle. Okay? That changes everything. So, exactly. This is how little you know about the way the universe actually is. Okay? Now, that's the okay. case. 99% of the people never learn that. Now, the same thing I want to ask you about things like evolution. Do you need to learn about evolution to be a scientist, to be a member of society? Probably not. But knowledge about it opens up your mind to bigger questions, which then maybe, maybe it's not even about biology. Maybe it's about forcing yourself to think like that. Makes you smarter when other things in life. So next time someone comes to you and tells you something like I just told you, what if I was very creative and just invented all this? 
I didn't, it's true, but what if I did invent all of this, right? Because I'm a person of authority, you go home telling people, next person that follows you say, ha ha ha, nice roll, right? But they're going to look at you like, what you're doing, what are you doing? It's like, you know, that's right. So like, just with, by the way, remember that. Remember that, by the way. According to Einstein, you cannot fall down, right? So next time you fall, just roll with it and get back up. All right? No. Einstein is wrong. This whole thing I just told you is absolutely wrong. What? Oh, Einstein was in 1902. I mean, you expect really for him, for us, not to have learned anything new about the universe? Now we're talking about gravity in terms of particles called gravitons that we're searching and trying to locate and find. But it shows that we understand, like, and there's actually some astrophysicists that think that there's a kind of negative gravity that's pushing the universe faster and faster away from the center, center if there is a center. Basically, it's causing the universe to expand faster and faster. It's called the dark energy. The fact of the matter is, we don't really know how gravity really works. It is the, one of the biggest mysteries in physics. Nobody really knows. But we know that Einstein's explanation is incomplete, and we know it's better than Newton's explanation which is better than Gallup, my point. Yeah. Absolutely. Evolution is wrong. I have no doubt. <laughs> but here's, right? So, but, 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 it is the best truth I have. Are you, are you with me I'm trying to say? So, I'll give an example. I'll give an example. Give an example. Do you think that if you come back and humans are still around a thousand years from today, and you have a heart condition, do you think we're going to be opening people's chests and then no. doing something with their heart? Yeah. No. Someone is going to tell them, barbaric. You're used to open people's hearts? That's how they'll talk of us. The barbarians. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine opening the heart? Savages. <laughs> Savages they were. Savages. Right? <laughs> but if I have a congenital heart disease, that I need a new heart. Then straight I'm going to go to a doctor right now and get a heart transplant. I know it's the bad way to do it. It's ridiculous. Get a new heart into my body? That's ridiculous. There's got to be something better than that. But there isn't right now, so I get a heart transplant. I really feel what I'm trying to say. Is it, why, is it so, why is it so hard to accept that? A lot of people have trouble with that. Just because truth is transient, it doesn't mean you can't trust the truth that you have right now. Are you feeling what I'm trying to say? Does that make sense? All right. That's not what I said. I said there is no right. I didn't say everything's right. It's right at the moment. That's right. So next time a teacher tells you you're wrong about that, you just speak, no, you're just trying to say I'm not right. You can't really be wrong and you can't really be right. You can't just not be right and not be wrong. But more important, hey, by the way, let's talk about this. Hey, this is Origin of Life, but if you guys are interested, I'll keep going. Hey, it's okay. If you, since you're interested in this philosophical concept, I mean, you know, I have to go back to the Origin of Life, but since you seem interested, I'm going to teach you a little more philosophy here, okay? What about morality? Oh my God. Oh my God. Hey, so, so make a buzz. Is there a right? Is there a wrong? Okay? So for example, thou shalt not kill. That's a commandment in the Christian Bible, in the, uh, in the Judaism, Judaism, it's also a commandment in Islam. And actually, everybody that is a devout Hindu uh, is against killing too, because they think that when you kill a human, you, you're ending the cycle that the chance that a person had to collect good karma and it's escalate to the next life in a better state. For the same reason Buddhism says it's bad because you ended up the chance that the person get to enlightenment. Uh, people in Taoism say that it's bad because you're making the balance of, you're, you're, you're twisting the balance of good and evil. How, Shintoism says it's wrong because it, it breaks the, oh no, there's different, the point is, a lot of people say it's wrong to kill. So then somebody goes into your house with a gun, it walks into their house with a gun, and but you were in a room that was obstructed, and then he went past you, and then you have a gun, right? And then this person has a gun that's about to shoot your mother, 
and you have a gun, you can shoot him from behind. He doesn't even know you're there. And it's going to save your mother's life. He, as far as I'm concerned, I've pulled the trigger. I don't even think about it. All right? But it would kill him. Of course, I can shoot him in the leg. But if I shoot him in the leg, there's a chance he's going to get up and shoot my mother. All right? All right? If I'm really good, I shoot his arm. But then he drops his gun. I always ask myself that. Our cops are supposed to be super trained and are sharp, sharp and shit. So why not just shoot the person's arm so they drop the gun? Why don't we wear Kevlar if they're really about really worrying about being shot back? Just wear some Kevlar, right? Protective Kevlar. Like, and then shoot people in the arms or in the legs so you don't have to kill them. Or shoot them six times. Or, you know, to really neutralize the effect. I really think it's excessive. And if you look at Europe, uh, where cops barely even carry guns, it's a lot of places. Because of those kinds of things. It, it, it diminishes death. But anyways, the point is, what is good and what is evil? Is there a right? Is there a wrong? Sometimes some philosophies say that things are relative. All right? Now, just because, and I'm not sure, I'm not going to tell you where I stand on this. This is a very complex issue. But I will tell you something. Just because there's, there's, it's hard to say what is right, it's very easy sometimes to say that there are certain things which are absolutely always wrong. That's my view on it. It's my opinion on it. It's hard to say what's right sometimes. But it's sometimes very easy to say things which are absolutely wrong. So for example, one plus one is not three. That's wrong. Are you with me? That's just wrong. Okay? And then it's not like, you know, oh, I got this wrong in a test, but hey, listen, there is no right. So I might be right. No, you're wrong. That's wrong. I with me. Yeah. But the same way, the same way, the same way that it's uh, that it's wrong to say, for example, that the Earth orbits around the Sun. No, that the Sun orbits around the Earth, or that things don't evolve. All right. That's just wrong. I with me. I'm trying to say. But anyways, keep going. Uh, next question. What does the theory of evolution suggest? Oh, we talked about this already. We're gonna go quick because we're wasting time. Because of common descent and the same of modification, evolution implies, right, that if things come from other things, which 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 come from other things, come from other things, eventually you have a root for the tree, right? And therefore an origin of life. So even though evolution and evangelists are about different things, evolution implies that could be an, uh, an original source of life, okay? Describe a few different hypotheses about the origin of life. Okay? Uh, okay, so let's talk about some of these things. But as I do that, I'm going to do that. So I'm just going to throw some ideas at you guys. First of all, so there's, these are the ones we have to talk about. Primordial soup. Reducing atmosphere. Okay. RNA rolled hypothesis. Um, abiotic synthesis of organic compounds both simple and complex organic compounds panspermia or transpermia To name a few. So these are some ideas associated with the origin of life, okay? So in the 1920s, 1930s, science is trying to figure out uh, what kind of conditions could have existed on the early Earth, right? Um, they studied the early Earth, and we'll talk about in a second how they figured this out. Now, uh, so there's a scientist called um, Operin. So for each of these things, I'm going to tell you some people who did work associated with it in a different color. Where's my little... So, I'm going to use orange for the scientists. This guy, over here we have Operin. Over here we have Haldin. Okay. Uh, I don't really know anybody in particular associated with the RNA hypothesis, but this one we can talk about Miller Yuri. Miller and Yuri. And don't really know any particular science to say with that either. And I want to put some evidence 
for these things. There is some evidence for these hypotheses in red. And we also have to talk about what they are. But that I'm not going to write down here. You should, though. So primordial soup is the idea that in the early life, what is that? Actually, you tell me. Madison, what is primordial soup? Do you know what that's about? No? Why not? You need to watch the videos. Sit. Adiel. Mm -hmm. Do you know what primordial soup is all about? No. Catherine? Kaluf? 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 You do not know. Oh. What, what does it sound like, primordial soup? It's a mixture of something. A mixture of things in the primordial times. All right? So it's, it's the idea that the building blocks of life were available, readily available, in this planet in a shallow ocean full of hydrothermal vents in the early history of life, okay? So before life was in this planet, the ocean would have had all these chemicals necessary to have life. Because I ended the last class talking about this, and it's actually very important. Life is great, right? Life. But before you can talk about life, you have to talk about Earth. There's got to be an Earth. And of course, that is a whole story altogether. So in the beginning of my videos, I talk about... I talk about how we go from the Big Bang to the Earth. And in the, in the geological time scale you guys are doing, there are some steps that are important to get to the point where life can be possible. We need an atmosphere. We need an ocean full of water. We need a hydrologic cycle going on. And all these, uh, we need differentiated layers and plate tectonics. We need everything to have happened already. These are, these are pre-components that will go above biology, right? But, I, but anyways, in having already have an Earth, what was Earth like is the question that they had in the very beginning. So, Haldane said, well, it would have, it would have to be to have these shallow oceans full of these, um, these uh, compounds. Now, is there any evidence to support his hypothesis? Absolutely. So, if you do chemical analysis of rocks, analysis of early rocks. So, if you go to Australia, you'll find rocks which are 3 billion years old, exposed above the ground. All right? Canada has some, some large cratons which are really old as well. In some places of the earth, it's easy to find these very old rocks. When we study some of these old rocks, we sometimes notice that they're different. They don't have oxygen in them, for example. Right? All the other rocks on this planet, after a certain point, are oxidized. All the iron minerals are, 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 are oxide. The, the color of the rocks looks different because they're oxidized. But the ancient rocks, all right, are not, right? Which brings us to the next point, which is also the same kind of evidence, all right? But specifically, lack of oxygen. Uh, Operand suggested, based on the chemical analysis of rocks, that the early atmosphere of the Earth was devoid of oxygen. Because the rocks, but in Washington, D.C., they have this uh, really cool museum, the Smithsonian, and they have the biggest natural history museum in the planet. And in the Smithsonian, there's a rock, a huge rock, a block the size of this wall that you can look at. They picked it out from somewhere. I don't know where it exactly come from. I forgot. But and I have pictures. Maybe I should show it to you guys. I have to dig it up. But the picture of the rock is interesting because you see the layers of rock, and they're all black and stuff. And all of a sudden, they turn red, right? Now, it's not because it changed to a different kind of rock, like a more muddy kind of rock sometimes, like limestone will be, a uh, sandstone, sorry, will be like erratish, like it is in, the, uh, in uh, some of the canyons in the, in the Colorado Plateau, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's red because it's, the whole rock is iron, and the, the deep below rock, old, old, old rock, was dark iron because there's no oxygen in it, but then the part that became oxidized because there was already oxygen in the atmosphere at the time that rock formed is, is reddish. So, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. You can also tell from the rocks the amount of carbon dioxide that was in the air at the time, the amount that, uh, what other gases were around at the time. And then when we do that kind of analysis, we get things like this. We get methane, we get ammonia, NH3, we get a carbon dioxide, we get sulfuric acid, we get uh, water vapor, but no oxygen. Those happen to be the things that come off of volcanoes a lot, all right? 
sulfur, phosphorus, methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide, they come off volcanoes. If you go to the Yellowstone Park, take a sample of the water, that's what exactly what's coming off the volcanoes. So that's exactly what we think. Or the Earth, very volcanic, that's the kind of gases that were in the Earth atmosphere instead of the oxygen that exists today, the nitrogen that exists today. So where does all the nitrogen come from? Where does all the oxygen come from? And that's something to ask, because it certainly did not come from volcanoes. So if, if you imagine, and if, if those of you who watch my videos, you know this, Earth started as a big blob of fire. Collisions between these blocks of things hit them, and it formed this large, ginormous blob of fire. Eventually, when the collision stopped because the, the Earth's orbit was cleared, after all the billions of years of literally a half a billion year worth of collisions, a big blob of Earth, molten rock basically, started to cool off. This still hasn't finished the cooling off process because the mental and the core are still are largely molten, right? The inner core is solid, right? Because of all the pressure of the layers being put on it. This sounds familiar to anyone? The seventh grade ge uh, geology, if you're an eighth grader, Maybe you didn't learn about this plate tectonic stuff, but the inner side of the Earth is, is solid. I even have a little thing of that. Right? It's solid. But then you have a molten outer core, a kind of plastic rock in the mantle, and then a solid crust. But the solid crust is just the top of the cake that's already cool. It's still cooling. For a lot of reasons, the cooling is slow. Gravity compressing the Earth hits up the core. Radioactive decay is hitting up the core. And it still takes a long time for the heat to escape to space. So the Earth is still warm. But the point is, by about 3 billion years or so, the Earth was cool enough that it actually allowed the formation of the crust. And plate tectonics started, and the volcanoes, but the volcanoes were still erupting on the surface of the Earth here. And so the atmosphere of the Earth is like that. And by reducing, it just means the act of oxygen, it doesn't have this oxidizing effect that happens with everything. Oxidizing, have you seen what happens if you leave a wet piece of uh, metal just sitting somewhere? You come back the next day, the oxygen in the atmosphere will oxidize that. The problem with that is that oxidation would actually interfere with some of the chemical reactions that we think are necessary for life to start. But that's not a problem because evidence shows that there wasn't any oxygen in the atmosphere. So those are those two theories and the evidence that backs it up. What is the evidence? Well, just look at volcanoes today. So that's the first evidence. If you look at volcanoes today, that's what, it, that's what they're like and we expect it to be the same in the beginning. And if you look at the rocks, the chemical composition of rocks, you can look at the oxygen levels, carbon dioxide levels in the rocks, and it will corroborate that kind of mentality. Next big thing we have to talk about is this idea here, transpermit, transpermit. Okay, so then, here's the thing. To get to life is great, but see, what is life based on? Every single life form we know of. What is it made of? Cells. cells. Good, you already know something important. All right? Cells. But what are cells made of? Proteins, lipids, amino acids. Now, so these things are made of, remember we talking about this last class, what you are is proteins, right? But remember that proteins are like the building blocks of the cells, but the instructions to make the proteins is DNA. So DNA is the instructions to make the protein. Well, here's a, cash, here's a kitchen, kitchen in the egg situation now, right? Today, today, all the proteins in your body are made based on the instructions in the DNA, right? But so without DNA, you wouldn't have the thing. So what's more important, the actual building or the blueprint to make the building? Blueprint. Well, one or the other. You need both, right? You can't do it without the other. So you can't assemble today's proteins without the instructions to make them. But even more important than any of that is that these types of material, oh, by the way, you also need energy, which are the carbs, right? So proteins is the stuff you're made of. DNA is like, so this is, this, this is the, the actual building block, right? of life. This is what does stuff in life. This is the instructions. But you also need energy. Things like carbs and lipids. We'll learn about this later. Fats and also carbs. Right? Gives you the energy for life. What about, but these molecules, these, com these are complex organic molecules. But the thing is that all of these complex organic molecules are made of smaller Lego pieces, which we'll call monomers. Monomers. We'll learn more about this in the incoming chapter about a month from now, okay? So monomers. Now, if these molecules are built of monomers, before I can even talk about these molecules, I have to talk about monomers. So you see, baby life is a big deal. Teachers and students, you 
students, please pardon this interruption. Will the boys varsity soccer players please report to the one twenty eight? The boys no soccer varsity here? soccer players please report to the one twenty eight. Thank you. Does it sound weird to call a sport soccer? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways. What do you do? Oh, I, I play soccer. Soccer. Hey, that's what I was just going to say. I play soccer. Yeah, you can just have a friend. Yeah, I used to play that at Vampire Academy. Hey. What do you do? I suck. Alright. Anyways. It's called football. American football is not even football. You, you kick it, what, two times in the game? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, there's a handball. Though. There's a sport called handball. It's, it's kind of like soccer, but you play with your hands. It's just it's just football, though, because there's nothing else to call. But it's called football because that ball is supposed to be called a football. The actual ball. It's just. Why is it called a football, though? It's, made it's, 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 it's not made from a foot. It's a foot long. But, <laughs> but not even. It's actually 11 inches or something like that. Yes. Soccer, soccer was originally called football. It's not changed to soccer. Americans call it soccer. Everybody else calls it football. Football. Yeah. It is just we just need we need to have a differentiation. That's all it is about. It's a business decision because Americans don't want to confuse people, so they call football soccer, and they have this other football. Don't get me started. I'm from Brazil, and the rest of the world calls football football. Just the Americans call it soccer. But anyways, yes, maybe that's why Americans soccer at it, right? All right. Now, now big job by the way. The girls are really good. Yeah. Girls at American soccer is really good. Yeah. And the guys are getting better. No. Hey, Mommers! <laughs> hey, that's all you can really do. Get better, right? So anyways. Yeah. Unless you feel it. <laughs> Listen. Monomers. Before I can have life, I have to have cells. Before I can have cells, I have to have complex molecules. But before I have complex molecules, I have to have simple organic molecules. The problem is that all of these molecules today are made by living things, right? You can actually make DNA copies in your body. You can make proteins in your body. You can make carbs in your body. You can make fat in your body, unfortunately. That's unfortunately because we do need the fat. And you can even make the building blocks to make those things. Although a lot of the building blocks you get off the plants, the plants make a lot of the amino acids, but you can actually convert one amino acid to another type if you don't have that type. Say your diet is lacking in a certain type of amino acid, the majority of amino acids can be produced from other amino acids. Mm -hmm. So your body can actually produce these chemicals. But see, that's the thing. All the building blocks of life are made by life today. So that becomes a problem. You need to build life without the building blocks which life builds. Oh my God. What? I'm, I'm just kidding. See, these are the building blocks for life. And we have to make we have to have the mission of building the building blocks without life. Now, that's where most people who are trying to convince you that this is impossible stop. And they say that's why you can't have life without a creator. Because you can't have life without the building blocks for life, and life is a thing that builds the building blocks. Case closed. Well, not quite. So let's talk about panspermia, first of all. Panspermia is the idea that maybe the building blocks, or even life itself, remember you write down what it is if you don't have it in your notes, maybe the building blocks, or even life itself, came from outer space. Now, we don't have any evidence that life itself may have come from outer space until the day that an alien from outer space shows up and says, I did it. You know? <laughs> so, um, I've met a few aliens, but none have taken credit for that. Oh my god. So. Oh my god. He's a Oh my god. So, transpermia is a little more fetchy. Transpermia is the idea that there's someone out there tr purposely seeding life. But that's not supernatural, by the way. It's the idea that as other life, life evolves somewhere else, 
and then the life was placed here. Are you with me what I'm trying to say? But there's no evidence for that. Okay? But for Pittsburgh, yeah, the idea that life or the building blocks of life may have come from somewhere else, there's some evidence for that. Alright? There's something called the Munchkinson. Like in the Wizard of Oz. Much concerned meteorite. Don't quote me on it. I tend to mess up, mess up this word. All right? I actually seen this meteorite and it's on the Smithsonian. The thing is that it's a rock, a meteorite from outer space. Well, that's kind of like, um, redundant. It's a meteorite. It's from outer space. All right? But the cool thing about it is that it's full of amino acids inside. And amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Amino acids. All right? Now, hold on, hold on. This is important. This is huge. The building blocks of life cannot be made without life. Bunch of some meteorite, you're wrong. Because there's no life in outer space that we know of, and there it is. A meteorite full of amino acids. That proves that right, amino acids can exist without life. In addition to that, there are over... 25 different naturally occurring amino acids in the planet Earth which do not appear in life. They were they are built of, from other geological processes. They're not, they don't appear in life, but they are built from geological processes. So that means, do you need life to have complex organic molecule? No. Are you with me? I'm trying to say. So together with naturally occurring, naturally occurring amino acids. Even some of the amino acids that are produced by life occur naturally, without life. And so, some of okay. them. So that means it's possible that from the beginning, it wasn't life that made them. It was already around because of some other process. We'll talk about how that works in a second. Alright? There is another so this is the idea that it comes from outer space, because they're naturally occurring in outer space, okay? Now, there's another idea that supports this idea, which is the idea that maybe it was made on Earth. Now, there's the Miller-Urey experiment, right? So let's just watch a quick video on this. Be quiet! Watch! Stephen Clearly presents. Oh, look, it's stated clearly! What was the Miller Yuri experiment? It was once believed that if you left food out to rot, living creatures like maggots and even rats would simply poof into existence. The idea was called spontaneous generation. Now, this has been disproven, right? By several experiments, which include Spanzani, Reedy, and Pasteur. All right? In the book, it talks about this. What they disprove, though, is not that life can't come out of uh, uh, nowhere. What they disprove is that complex life can't come out of nowhere. But we're not trying to create complex life here. We're trying to talk, create very simple life. All right? Are you with me? I'm trying to say. So you're not going to get a rat or a fly out of nowhere. They get the fly show up because a fly, uh, the little maggots show up because a fly lands on and lays an egg, right? Rats show up because they smell and come to call for it. The bugs are not coming out of nowhere. If you keep it in a closed container, no maggots will come, right? That's what uh, Reedy did. And then Sponzani showed that uh, roths would not rot unless they were open to the air. And then Pasteur modified his experiment and said, I'll even leave it open to the air, but I'll leave a little turn on the, on the, on the vial. So it's like a vial, and there's a little turn like this. So then it's open to the air, but it still doesn't rot. Because the, the, um, the things can't fall into it. They get trapped by a little curve. The bacteria can't fall in the air. Of course, both of them, Spallanzani and Reedy, uh, and, and Pasteur, realized that bacteria is already in the broth to begin with. So if you just leave it there, it rots because there's already stuff in it. But if you boil it and kill the bacteria and then close it, it doesn't rot because you kill the bacteria. If you're trying to say, he invented pasteurization. You boil the milk, then you close it, it will last a very long time. You feel what I'm trying to say? So that's, but he was not 
he didn't prove though that life can has to come from life. What he proved is that bacteria comes doesn't come out of nowhere, and that maggots doesn't come out of nowhere. But you can't get a one result and generalize and say that's what you proved. Likewise, the Miller-Urey experiment is not even about the origin of life. So you can't say, oh, Miller-Urey proved the origin of life. Because that's not what they're set out to prove. So you cannot generalize like that. You know what I'm trying to say? You can only prove what you actually set out. A series, series of experiments starting in the 1600s disproved this idea. That's really and in the 1800s, a new scientific, scientific law was proposed. Life only comes from life. It's, it's true that rats, rats maggots, and, and even microbes are far too complex, complex to simply proof into existence. existence. But, but in 1859, English naturalist Charles Darwin put forth the theory of evolution. In it, he showed that under the right circumstances, relatively simple creatures can gradually give rise to more complex creatures. Given this information, serious thinkers began to wonder, is it possible that simple life forms actually could come from non-living matter? Not by proving into existence, but through a natural, gradual process similar to what we see in biological evolution. Darwin himself mentioned this idea when writing to a friend. But if, and oh what a big if, he wrote, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, and so on present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. <laughs> he was right. In 1924, Russian biochemist Alexander O'Heron published a book which he titled The Origin of Life. In it, he outlined his thoughts on a gradual progression from simple chemistry to living cells. He imagined the early ocean as a primordial soup, a rich collection of complex molecules produced by natural chemical reactions. In this soup, further reactions could take place, eventually producing living cells. At the time, Darwin's warm little pond and O'Karen's primordial soup were only just speculation. They were founded on a good understanding of chemistry and biology, but they could not be considered legitimate scientific hypotheses because no one had found a way to test or observe them. Science, after all, is the study of observable facts and an ongoing conversation about how those facts can be best linked together. Chemical reactions like those proposed by Darwin and O'Parron are not expected to leave an observable fossil record without either having fossils to examine or a time machine to travel back and observe what happened. How could scientists even begin to study the origin of life? And in the 1950s, Stanley Miller, then a graduate student at the University of Chicago, came up with an idea. We can simulate early Earth conditions in the lab and then carefully watch what happens. If, if you can't study fish, fish in the sea, set up an aquarium. Working with his professor, Harold Urey, Miller designed an apparatus to simulate the ancient water cycle. Together they put in water to model the ancient ocean. It was gently boiled to mimic evaporation. Along with water vapor, for gases of the atmosphere they chose methane, hydrogen, and ammonia. These are simple gases which scientists at the time thought were probably abundant on the ancient Earth. They added a condenser to cool the atmosphere, allowing water molecules to form drops and then fall back into their ocean like rain. The ancient Earth would have had many sources of energy, sunlight, geothermal heat, and even thunderstorms, so they added sparks to the atmosphere to simulate lightning. The goal of the experiment was not to create life, but to simply test the first step in O'Parron's model. Can simple chemistry naturally give rise to the complex molecules of life? So, I spent maybe, I can't quantify it, maybe 100 hours, maybe 200, collecting the best YouTube videos on biology. When you have that folder podcast and the folder videos and web tutorials, all this wonderful stuff is there. And it basically... Like, aside from my videos, you have things like this. You have things like Amoeba Sisters. There's way too much for you to be lost and confused and not getting it. Are you with me, I'm trying to say? When I listen to this guy talk, I get it. It's simple. Are you with me, I'm trying to say? Now, this is a very important thing that a lot of you guys were confused on Sally just two days ago. Were they trying to prove the origin of life? No. Now, what are they trying to prove? The first 
the first step. Right? Just the first, but that's a, such an important step because can we have life without the building blocks? So we need to make the building blocks. By the way, do we need this to be true? What if this is wrong? Does it throw the whole thing to God? No, because a panspermia may have come from somewhere else. And it wasn't a meteorite, remember? So if it's in one or two, or, by the way, we're in the 21st century. We have another one to put in here. All right? Stardust mission. And now there's even another one that actually landed on a comet and went back to the Earth with samples from the comet. The stardust one just flew by by the tail of the comet and took a bunch of stuff from it. All of amino acids. We do not need life to make organic molecules. They just happen because of chemistry, because of physics. Right? Let's keep going. After running the experiment for just one week, the ocean became brownish black. Careful analysis revealed that through a series of reactions, many complex molecules had been produced. Among these were amino acids, special molecules of life that we once thought could only be built inside the bodies of living creatures. This was a pivotal breakthrough in science, so significant in fact, that it gave rise to an entirely new field of research now known as prebiotic chemistry. Scientists don't know for sure if the gas is used. By the way, that was in the 1920. It's almost uh, 30. It's almost 100 years ago. And then that field of research has been doing work for 80 years. You think that this is the experiment we still talk about when we talk to the friend, chemical evolution? No. That's just the beginning of it. And so we have way more research done since then that shows that these steps actually make sense. By Miller, really one of the most common gases of the ancient Earth. Because of this, many experiments have since been done, showing that the molecules of life can form in a wide variety of environments with different starting chemicals and different sources of energy. Sugars, lipids, and amino acids have even been found on meteorites. This suggests that the molecules of life formed all throughout the ancient solar system and may be forming right now in other regions of our galaxy. That's the most interesting thing. That if this is a rule of physics, then we're not alone. This is happening somewhere else. Because if this is such a big universe, and it happened once over here, it's got to be happening somewhere else. About intelligence, maybe not. But I'm just waiting for the day that we find amino acids or even maybe a cell in Mars. And then this is like, you know, what about now? What is your excuse? Together, these discoveries tell us that our parents' primordial soup and Darwin's warm little pond could have easily existed in one way or another on our ancient planet. So to sum things up, what was the Miller-Urey experiment? The Miller-Urey experiment was our first attempt at simulating ancient Earth conditions, in this case, the ancient Earth's water cycle, for the purpose of testing ideas about the origin of life. The Miller-Urey experiment is significant for two main reasons. First, though it was not a perfect simulation of the early Earth, it clearly demonstrated for the first time that biomolecules can form under ancient Earth-like conditions. Second, the experiment took what was once mere speculation, the idea that life may have emerged from chemistry, and transformed a portion of that speculation into legitimate, testable science. Many questions remain to be answered about the origin of life, but, but scientists from many nations and many, many fields of study are now following Stanley Miller's lead. They're finding ways to turn those questions about the origin of life into testable scientific hypotheses. Maybe one of you. Simulation experiments cannot tell us exactly how life formed in the past, but if enough of them are done, they could eventually tell us if it's possible for life to emerge from chemistry. I'm John Perry, and that's the Miller-Urey experiment Stated clearly. Good stuff, right? All right, so then, if this was AP Biology, I would take you all the way and tell you exactly how it all happened. I do that on my videos, though, so if you're interested, just watch it, and it's all there. But, um, we, we, for biology, what we really talked about is that the first step there, the formation of monomers, is possible. Either through something like that happening on the Earth, in some place of the Earth, or coming from out of space, but there are the monomers. How do you go from monomers to complex molecules and eventually to life? Just watch my videos, it's all there, okay? 
and and it's not really something you are required to know. As far as complex molecules go, though, we think that the first one was RNA. RNA is most likely the best candidate for the original molecule of life. And this is called the RNA rule hypothesis. So RNA is like DNA, but it has only one strand. So you see the DNA I have over there? Imagine being only one strand right here, right? Only one strand. It's simpler. Today, RNA comes from DNA. So today, by the way, to do a DNA molecule, it's very easy. Just wiggle it, then wiggle it back, and then just do the little place. Oh, All right. But anyways, today RNA comes from DNA, and it, the proteins are made from the template of RNA that you make the proteins. All right. So then, that's how it works today. But you see, this is why RNA is a good candidate. How would you go to DNA from RNA? You just get another one next to it, and it becomes a double helix. Are you with me? And then you string a bunch of them, you make a huge double helix. Today, proteins come from RNA. So it makes sense the proteins that exist today would eventually have come from RNA. Today, RNA does multiple jobs that some proteins do. They carry stuff, they help things go faster, which is what enzymes do. We're going to learn about this soon. All right? they, they make copies of themselves sometimes. They're, this is a very crucial thing. This is why we think they're the first two, because they're self-copying. The actual building blocks that build RNA have the energy necessary to build the molecule itself. In other words, it's almost as if the legal piece, the energy necessary to put two legal pieces together is in the legal piece itself. Are you with me? So that provides RNA a self-replication feature, which is crucial to take the final step from here to here, which is on the videos. So that, so again, let's sum it up. Let's do it clearly. Why do we think RNA was the original molecule of life. Because today it acts as a bridge between DNA and protein. Number one, make sure you write these things down, it's important. Number two, why do you think, so because today it acts, don't just write what I write on the board, why would I say? Because today it acts as a bridge between DNA and protein. Because today, all right, you can make DNA RNA from RNA, all you need is to double, you just make another side for it. RNA does many of the jobs that proteins do, different types of RNA. Some can even copy themselves. Some act to speed up chemical reactions, right? Some actually carry things around, right? Some are structural purpose, just same way as today some proteins do. So we think the cells today still use RNA for those functions because they started using RNA for those functions. So this is an idea that we have, but it's basically a logic. There's no proof of it, right? But it's based on the logic that RNA just makes sense. So these are the uh, issues about the origin of life. As far as the actual original life form, I'm not going to take you there. But we're not going to make all of these. Uh, the, the very important assumption here is that you would not start with a complex bacteria. All you need at the very start is the simplest possible thing, which is a fat bubble with a self-replicating molecule on the inside. That's called protobiont. Protobiont. Now, that self-replicating molecule could be RNA. In this bubble, did you ever put oil inside of water? Yeah. What happens? It, like, it separates from the water, right? Uh -huh. And if you stir it, what happens? A bunch of tiny little bubbles. Leave it alone, what happens? Try it. If you don't have it, never see it. Get a cup of water, put a little bit of water, stroll the hell out of it, come back two hours later, tell me what happens. And you're going to tell me if you think you need to do, any, anyone needs to do anything for bubbles to form in water. Are you with me? Oil bubbles just form when you put them in water. It's the, the way of things. Now, if you imagine an ocean always swirling around, those bubbles can divide. And if they can divide, they can, they, they can also gather each, with each other because one absorbs the other and get bigger. But the thing about getting bigger is that if you have something inside, we'll learn about this later in the year, more water goes inside of you, which makes you get bigger. But if you get bigger, you split more, which you then is not natural selection. The more stuff that is inside, the bigger you get, the more you split. So any of these bubbles that have a molecule inside that has an ability to self-replicate and therefore grow more stuff inside, will have an advantage over other bubbles. And now it's no longer random. Now it's Darwinism. 
So when you get this far, the rest is evolution. So then, watch the videos. I explain this in detail. I, this is not IEP, so I'll just give you a little hint of what it's like. They don't expect to know how life started, but they do expect to know some of the theories behind it. Okay? And if you want to go all the way, if you're interested in it, watch this from the podcast folder, including mine. I explain everything to you guys. All right? So there's only 20 minutes left. I'm going to leave it up to you. Do you want to do some work, or do you want me to teach about natural history, the natural history of the Earth? Uh, work, raise your hand, because you might be tired. Or we could have the entire next class for work instead of, and just finish this right now. Okay. So, these are some of the events that are the most important events that we have to put in order for to begin with. All right? So, okay. So let's talk about, um, so let's talk about some of these things. Okay, so what needs to, this is kind of help you with the mentality of what you need to do for your project, okay? Uh, it's kind of offset, and there's a number zero, one, there's no number one there, but let's just think about what had to be first. What had to be there first? And that's how the logic of what you need to do to do your project, okay? So I'll go one by one, and then I'll just try to, try to figure this out. Abiotic synthesis of macromolecules. So that's number two. So I'll put up number two over there. Okay? Abiotic synthesis of macromolecules. Abiotic simple or simple organic molecules. Before or after? Simple. Before. The, the macro, big molecules, like proteins and DNA, have to be after the simple, right? So three comes first. All right. Big Bang. One. Got to be all the way to the beginning, right? Development of an atmosphere. Before this or after this? Before, of course. It's the atmosphere that gives you the things you need to make the molecules, right? So you need to have a development of the atmosphere. Development of the geosphere, the solid part of the Earth. Does that come before or after the atmosphere? Before. The atmosphere comes from the volcanoes, which is geosphere. Does that, you see what I'm trying to say? So it's before. So seven is before. Development of the hydrosphere, the water part of the Earth. After the atmosphere, because it rains down from it. Are you with me? It's the clouds that gather from the volcanic eruptions that actually form rain, and then it falls down, and eventually the hydrological cycle gathers enough water to form the, the hydrology things. Okay. Earth formation. The big bang. After the Big Bang. Before the atmosphere, the, the geosphere, right? So Earth formation. So I have to put Earth formation here. Nine. Eukaryogenesis. Or the origin of eukaryotic life. Life that has internal membranes and complex organelles inside. After two. Towards the end here. The evolution of sex. Does bacteria have sex? No, they just. So that means, don't, is that before or after eukaryotes are around? After. after. Okay. So, evolution of sex, 11. Okay. The formation of a galaxy. Right after Big Bang. All right, so let's put 12. It's going to be 4 and then 12 and then 9, right? Yeah. Okay. Glycolysis. This is the ability to break down sugar to get energy from it. Uh, is that after life or before life? After, after life, but before complex cells? How are comp cells going to get complex without enough energy? Right? So before. Does that make sense you're talking about? Okay. Land plants. That's what you after. After eukaryotes, right? So land plants, 14 eukaryotes. All right. Multicellularity and specialization of cells. So loss of special... That's before the plants, though. Because plants are very complex multicellular life. Are you with me? So then before 14. So 15 and then 14. Okay. Panspermia. If it happened... Before the building of simple organic molecules, right? But after the earth was already around and stuff. So I'll throw panspermia here. Okay. Photosynthesis and the oxygen revolution. Okay, now, now it gets tricky. Does that happen before or after glycolysis? Or the ability to, to, to break down sugar? Well, glycolysis doesn't use oxygen. It's just, we're going to learn about this later in the year. So it's got to be after that. But 10 is eukaryogenesis, or the evolution of eukaryotic life. Now, here's the thing about eukaryogenesis. There are bacteria that do photosynthesis. All right? 
So bacteria were already doing photosynthesis by the time eukaryotes evolved. So that means it goes before eukaryogenesis. Is that clear? Yeah. All right. So over here, starts over here. It won't, co it won't continue for a while, but it starts before eukaryogenesis. Uh, protobionts, protected bubbles, self-replicating molecule, RNA roll hypothesis. Be after after biotic synthesis of the three, right? After two, actually, because you have to have complex molecules before the first protobiont, right? So then you got 18. The solar system for reducing Earth or primarial soup state. That's both. Is it, let's see a six. Development of an atmosphere will be after that, right? Development of the hydrosphere. Or that's actually supposed to be after the atmosphere. We have this wrong. It's like this. So it would be after that, all of that, right? So then we put 19. Solar system formation. After galaxy, but before the Earth, right? So then let me go 20 and then 9, okay? And then 7 over here. Stromatolites, the first fossils of bacteria before or after eukaryogenesis or the evolution of eukaryotic life. Before, because they were bacteria. But before or after photosynthetic life which is number 10 over there, is eukaryogenesis. But number 17 is photosynthesis. Stromatolites are not photosynthetic. It's like earlier bacteria than that. So it would be before that. You see, you would have to research the facts, know something about them to put them in order. So this goes before 17, so it will be right here. 13 and then 21, which is why it's easier to sort on the computer and then write it down. Are you with me what I'm trying to say? Because you keep changing the order as you go along. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. All right. What I do want to do, though, bef uh, as far as this, is some of these I want to talk about, why they're important. These are milestones of the history of life. You see the, under the underlying ones? Yeah. So we got to talk about the underlying ones. Okay? We already did these two, though. All right? The Cambrian explosion, I forgot about that one, but that's actually before the land plants. But the, uh, right? So let's talk about the Cambrian explosion. Once glycolysis was around, and allow cells can use energy from glucose. That, before glycolysis, when you break down su sugar, all right, you, you just have to rely on sugar that's right there, or energy that's right there, either from a hydrothermal vent or directly from the sun or something. But after you had the, the, the evolution of the ability to store and break down sugar, you now can make some energy, go somewhere, and use that energy that you have stored. And you can actually, glycolysis allows life to do a lot more. Eventually, aerobic respiration, which is breaking down sugar even further, produces nine times the amount of energy. Around that time, there was an explosion of diversity on life. So the Cambrian explosion is like this. Think about it this way. There was like a few types of life, and all of a sudden, there's billions of types of life. Are you with me? So the fossil record shows this random event. They have very little fossils, very rare. And all of a sudden, you have a lot of fossils. What made that happen? This is important, okay? You're supposed to write this stuff like this down. It's the ability to fully break down sugar with high efficiency that made that happen. Because it gave your life more energy to do more. And that translated into an explosion, explosive evolution. Why is this one important then? Glycolysis, the ability to break down sugar. I already said it. It allows life to be able to store and use energy later, okay? Multicellularity. Why is that important? Because cells working together, even if you just form a colony, a bunch of bacteria living together, you're going to defend each other and work better. But in a colony, they're all the same and they're not really specializing. On a multicellular organism, like an algae, right, right, some algae are multicellular, you have certain parts doing some jobs, certain parts doing other jobs. When you make someone a specialist, they'll do that job better. I really think I'm trying to say. So our body works like that. Do all our cells do the same thing? No, each cell has a job. But because each cell has a job, it's better at it. Are you with me? I'm saying. If everybody was trying to do everything, we would suck at everything. But if each one of us works at one thing and gets good at it and contributes to the whole, as a population, we can literally dominate the world. Isn't that what we did as a kind? Right? And that's exactly what our body does. What the human species is doing is a micro, microcosm of what your body does. Your cells, each one of them, specialize, do the job better together, right? That's huge. What, that's what allowed the chemical exposure to happen as well. What's that happen? Okay? Here's another one. 
uh, pan spermia, we've talked about why that's important, because even if you couldn't make it on the Earth, it could come from outer space. Uh, oxygen revolution. This one is huge. Okay? As soon as you have photosynthesis, something crucial happens. Okay? Something very, very important happens. Oxygen. Before, you only had carbon dioxide, ammonia. By the way, there's some uh, bacteria that start before the oxygen revolution. There was a nitrogen revolution. And the bacteria transform a lot of that ammonia to nitrogen. And that's why the atmosphere is so full of nitrogen. If you already start on scrambling the project, you know that's mentioned in there. Nitrogen fixation bacteria is before the oxygen revolution. But once photosynthesis evolved, or the ability to capture sunlight to produce sugar, all right? You break down water, you make oxygen. You capture carbon dioxide, you make sugar. This is what photosynthesis is. When that evolved, all of a sudden, the world starts becoming more oxygenized. Now, why does that matter? Because the, the ability to break down sugar fully depends on that oxygen. It involves laughter. All right? So you can break down sugar without oxygen, and you get 4 ATP of energy. You break down sugar with oxygen, you get 36. You see why that matters then? After photosynthesis, life, the next step is the evolution of breaking down that sugar to that level. And that means we can now actually do much more because we have more energy. Second reason why it's important, the ozone layer. Without oxygen, there's no ozone layer. Without ozone layer, there's no protection from the sun rays. Life is confined to the water. After the ozone layer is around, life can go to the land. Because now there's no solar radiation destroying life if it tries to go on land. You probably trying to say, oxygen in the atmosphere reduces the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The more photosynthesis is happening, the more carbon is becoming sugar. The more carbon it becomes sugar, the less carbon is in the air. The less carbon is in the air, the cooler the Earth gets. It becomes more tolerable for more life forms to live in the planet. You see what I'm saying? We're no longer this life, hot atmosphere. It's more doable. So the oxygen revolution changes this world to a world that we, for example, can live in. Very important. All right? And then finally, last but not least, the stromatolites. Why are they so important? Stromatolites are these. I'm going to show you one of them. Okay? I don't finish here. Stromatolites. Oh, was the first one. Ah, by the way, thank you for putting up with me for so long. What do you mean? You know, a lecture day. Stromatolites. So see, these are these are um, a colony of algae so big that they form what it looks like rock. They're fossils, but they're they're fossilized rocks of algae colonies that live in the oceans, the shallow oceans of the world long years ago, all right? Cool. Now, they're being exposed right now, but these are, these stromatolites, if you look at it, it's a bunch of bacteria. The rock is basically a bunch of bacteria gathered together. It's like, you know how coral here in Florida is a bunch of coral? Limestone is a bunch of coral. <laughs> stromatolite is a bunch of, uh, of, of, a bunch of uh, um, bacteria. Lines and lines of bacteria. Now, the cool thing about it is that when you date that, the, batch, the, the rocks are billions of years old, right? So that's a huge thing because it proves that life is at least 2 billion years old in the planet. You know what I'm trying to say? We think 2.3 billion years old because of this. Which leads us to the last question of this lecture thing, all right? Oh my gosh, there's a bunch of more. No, it's, not, it's fine. We talked about something already. How did Earth change? Okay, we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, Describe types of evidence to substantiate the geological time scale. How do we know the Earth has been changing? This is in the natural history topics. You can participate here. Megan, how do we know the Earth has been changing across time? Like what? Where do we see that evidence? Fossil record, that's one. What else is in the natural history topics? Things that we know tell us the history of a changing world. Yes. The anatomy of most animals changing, but uh, vestigial structures, uh, homologous structures, analogous structures, good. Something else that tells us the world has been changing, not just life, the world, the climate, stuff like that. Yes? Um, the How do we know that happened? Where's the evidence? The iron, it was blacked out. Chemical composition of rocks that's still fossil records. Something else. Yes? It gets trapped in ice. Ice. Scores. Ice scores. Very good. Ice scores. What else can give us evidence of a changing world? 
Ever seen they drill ice and sediment cores to see what it used to be a long time ago. There's tree rings. You can look at the tree rings and see how thick they are. That means how much rain you got. How much carbon dioxide is in the plane. You can tell how hot it was. Okay, what chemicals are in the tree? You can tell. In the trees, every season is a ring. So you can tell it's like a timeline. This is in the natural history topics, okay? The different types of fossils that tell us different things. Uh, Corporalites. There are basically rocks that used to be, uh, it's like fossilized poop. Like seriously. And then there's, uh, there's, there's uh, gastrolites, fossilized rocks that used to be inside the stomach of, of uh, dinosaurs. Because the dinosaurs used to eat the stones to help them grind the food in their stomach. And then there's evidence in these stones now of the kind of food that they used to eat. You know what I'm saying? All kinds of things like that. It's in the natural history topics, uh, the lecture guide. Make sure you review that. It's going to be in the test. Now, how the changes in the Earth's climate affect the evolution of life? What happens to think about it? Every time there's an ice age, and then there's no more ice age, and then there's an ice age, and then what happens with life because of those things? There's extinctions, and then new life evolves to take the place of the ones that went extinct. All right, everything I'm saying? It causes extinctions. It causes change in the environment, which changes the pressure, which therefore changes the selection. Does that make sense? How did natural disasters affect the evolution of life? The same thing. They cause things to go extinct, we open up niches for other things to take its place. Is there evidence that, hers ha that they, there is evidence that the Earth has experienced a set mass extinctions, and yet the overall pattern of biodiversity has increased? Explain how this is possible. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about, and it's very important. Pay attention. If you do a graph of the diversity of life in the history of this planet, it will look like this. Very little light, very little light, very little light, very little light. Came an explosion. Very little light, very little light increase, very little increase, very little increase, mass extinction. And then it increases again, a little higher than it was before. Mass extinction. A little higher than it was before. Mass extinction. A little higher than it was before. Mass extinction. And this is keep happening. But each time there's a mass extinction, what happens afterwards? It grows bigger. Even bigger than it was before. Let's explain why that happens. By the way, so, I mean, if you ask me a question then, is mass extinctions a bad thing for the diversity of life? No. It's a bad thing for the life that goes away. <laughs> but it's a good way for thing. Here's why. Let's say you have niches. So there's two niches in the ecosystem. That's it. One organism is taking this one, the other organism is taking that one. Mass extinction happens. This organism here goes extinct. Its niche is now available. This organism, if a mutation happens, can evolve to take some of that niche. But each organism of the population can evolve to take a pieces of it. So instead of this being divided into two, it can be divided into more pieces. Are you with me? I'm trying to say. So instead of having that, I now have that. But now that creates more diversity. Another mass extinction happens. Those go extinct. That becomes available. But it doesn't split evenly. It splits into many. Over a history of time, every time there's a mass extinction, something taking up lots of niches, right, like we, go extinct, and then lots of things evolve to take up pieces of that niche. Do you see what I'm trying to say? And that is why diversity has increased throughout the history of life, even though mass extinctions have happened. My, a few times it's been very, very close. Like the point of mass extinction almost completely eradicated life on Earth. So why is evolution going? What is it trying to make? Is there a goal? Is there a purpose? Is there a direction that it's headed towards? Is, is there some sort of, if you come back a million years from now, are we going to be at that place? Is it, is it getting better? None of that. There's no girl, there's no... Any pattern that you see is only because the pressure to be that way has been that way for a long time. For example, we are becoming smarter. But only because being smart is advantageous. Are you with me? But there is no goal, there is no pattern, there is no purpose. It's just a process of change. Okay? So that is natural that's, that's natural evolution. We're done with the unit. Next topic, the cover. How do we classify all this variety that exists in life? The next two days will be activity days. I'll see you guys then. By the way, in two days, 
You really want to be here today. This could be a good class. Make sure you don't miss two, two classes from now. We're going to bring the, the, the craniums of the humanoids and look at them and analyze them and stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. He made a pencil out of Legos. This looks your like. Fantastic. How many does he get? Can you guys erase the ball from you on your way out? Thank you. Bellinger, Bellinger! Oh, take a fifth period and get out of here, though. I blew your mind enough. Get out of here. Bellinger! Basel, Basel, set of three. Basel! Yes. What? What's this? It's a vertebrae. It's just not very tough, but it has a vertebrae. 